As you all know, I'm Professor uh, Gary Foster, pleasure of being um, network director, and we have our co-director, Professor Neil Boonham. We thought we'd show you some pictures of smiling, relaxed faces at the start of the meeting, because we may deteriorate over the next few days. But one of the things that um, I was asked to do first was to set the scene for this particular meeting and to tell you that it's, it's going to be incredibly relaxed, it's not going to be formal, and it's, we have some serious work to do, but we're not going to treat it, we're going to take it in a very light-hearted way and work relaxed. And they put me on because I'm afraid I can't do serious talks. If any of you have heard me speak in the past, you're probably aware of this. Now, in terms of... Um, we're not on here. Richard, do you want to see if we can get this talk up? The moment is just retaining through someone's email. No, we're not moving. Another reason why they put me up first. Get all the sabotage out of the way first. No. No, we're not retaining with the controller. It's not connected, I heard someone whisper. <laughs> I have very good hearing. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's see if we can get this working. Um, so in terms of, of welcoming you here, we've already heard from our Deputy Mayor, but it's just amazing how many have travelled very long distances um, to be here, and I have to thank you for that. And we're going to tape some of the presentations with people's permission. Um, these will be made available through the connected website, and people who couldn't uh, make it today, they'll still be part of this, they'll still be able to input a large part of it. Now just so you can orientate yourselves uh, a little bit, we are currently uh, here in the M Shed. Uh, and Bristol was a very famous um, harbour port. And just across the bridges is a beautiful area for restaurants and bars and everything else. So you don't have to walk very far from your hotel. You are actually all in the same hotel, so hopefully you'll see each other at breakfast. Um, though if you're like Simon Leather, who was queuing at 6.30 this morning to get his breakfast, I don't think you'll, you'll see him at that early hour of the morning. Um, in terms of um, the harbour, well, actually you think, well, we're a long way from the sea, but in fact, it goes all the way through here, through the gorge, uh, underneath the very, very famous uh, suspension bridge, first ever suspension bridge. Uh, Isambard King de Brunel uh, designed that. He also designed the SS Great Britain, where we're having our conference dinner tomorrow, which was the first full metal boat, which is slightly further along the harbour. So we'll all be ship shape in Bristol fashion. We'll also be attending up at the university, which is um, up Park Street, which is a a reasonably steep hill, would you say? Um, thankfully, many of you will be walking down it later on. Um, I will be also visiting our um, biology department where you can see some of the facilities that we have. Uh, and also, it's got some of the best views over Bristol. We have, this is the building here, and we uh, have a glass um, uh, room at the top, our, our sky lounge, and a balcony so you can take some pictures of the night sky over Bristol. So in terms of that was geography, in terms of disease history, many of you are very much aware of the impact disease history has had throughout the years. And we know this all the way back to biblical times, and I should say uh, other religious books are available. Um, but in terms of uh, knowing the effect that it had, they knew that if you uh, give a curse to one tribe to another, say either you were ca casting blast mildews or rust, that if they lost their crop, there was more chance of harming those particular people than as if you had cast uh, animal disease or even a human disease because no food means starvation. And we know that those particular uh, diseases cause huge amounts of problems. Coming a little bit more up to date, um, the Romans really loved this part of the world. There are many Roman ruins in Bristol. These are the Roman baths that are preserved over in Bath, hence the name. Um, but even the Romans knew that um, plant disease could cause devastating effects. They went so far as to have a god, uh, Rebego Renego, and they quite often sacrificed young dogs or puppies 
to try and protect their crops. Now, it's really important because this is my new puppy, Finnegan, that we don't go back to those days and we come up with new solutions. As you can tell from my accent, I'm not Bristolian, even though the odd word when I say cider, uh, I have now picked up some of the um, accent. I'm originally from Ireland. And as you all know, um, we had a very devastating famine caused by a plant disease, uh, the Irish potato famine, Phytophthora infestans. And in terms of the effect, it was quite amazing. Uh, the population of Ireland back then was 8 million, and approximately 1.5 to 2 million people died, 1.5-ish million emigrated. The population of Ireland, even after all those hundreds of years, still hasn't passed back to that level. It's quite amazing. Now, in Ireland, we call this a spud. I am so pleased to know that in Africa, they call it an Irish. Yeah, proper potato. And the effects of Phytophthora are quite devastating. And it's also very similar to these days in that it was a combination of political situation, environmental situation, disease situation, etc. And we know that even if you manage to grow your potatoes through, that if you lift your potatoes, they were literally liquefied. They would run through your fingers. So the effects were that um, at the time, Ireland just happened to be occupied by England. I have to be careful what I say now I'm in England. And the English landlords, um, if you grew your potatoes, you grew them to feed your family, but you also sold excess at market and used the money to pay your rent to the English landlords. Because you, you've lost your crop and you couldn't pay, the English landlords kicked you out of your properties. So this is a family now living in a hedgerow. But like any Irish man, he's brought his jug of beer with him. <laughs> Very important. Many people uh, were placed into workhouses, and disease was rife for these workhouses as well. We know that we had these ships, it's almost like today in the Mediterranean, in that anybody who had a ship offered uh, to get involved in the business of immigration to Canada, uh, to Australia, and to America. And some of these ships should not have been more than five miles from the coast. So many of these ships were labeled the coffin ships because many people died uh, due to sinking or due to storms um, as they moved um, towards the, what they hoped was a better world. And it was actually the, the Irish potato famine that triggered this whole movement to have bigger and bigger ships that would allow large amounts of immigration so actually, it's the Irish potato famine that led to the Titanic, built in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and then sunk by the English. We have to be clear about this. It was fine when it left us. And we wouldn't have had that film with Leonardo DiCaprio and all that sort of thing as well. But the interesting thing about this is because we have this huge amount of immigration, this now means that no matter where you go in the world, you will find an Irish bar. These are the ones that I find most far-flung. We have one in Nepal. Cambodia and Mongolia. Now, because um, we have a lot of people from particular countries here today, we have the Dubliner in Nigeria, we have the Kura Irish Pub and Bistro in Kenya, and uh, we have Bubbles O'Leary, which I think it has to be one of the best names in Uganda. Have you visited? Yeah, oh my goodness. I don't know how to tell Tanzania, but the Georgian Dragon is an English pub name, even though they're an Irish pub. So they're very mixed up indeed. <laughs> now, I couldn't go amiss without telling you because you have tonight free and you may go out into Bristol. The best uh, Irish pub is very close to your hotel, just slightly further down the road. Seamus O'Donnell's Irish Bar, and I must recommend Irish Stew and a Guinness in that pub. Now, when you think of Ireland and you think of the Irish potato famine, most of romantic films and poems paint um, the Irish potato famine and the people who were affected as sort of in mud huts and, and thatched cottages, and etc. But I'm going to tell you a slightly more personal story in that it affected where I came from, which is a little town called Lurgan, which is, if you know the history of Ireland, we have two parts of Ireland. We have Northern Ireland, which belongs to the United Kingdom, and Southern Ireland. Now, we're fighting a lot over Brexit at the moment, and the Irish border comes up a lot. You can understand why we're fighting over it, because you can see the grass is greener in the north of Ireland compared to the south. But, but the town where I was born is called Lurgan, and we have a very, very, there was someone who ran the workhouse, and he kept unbelievably good records. 
Now this is a picture, which is just a couple of years after the potato famine, and this is a picture taken just from a couple of years ago. You can see it was a very modern industrial town. It became very famous for growing flax and producing linen. And I say, the famine of the dreadful visitation hit this area extremely badly. So in terms of um, where the workhouse was, we know exactly where the workhouse was because it eventually turned into the hospital. That's where I was born. That'll be famous one day. <laughs> Blue plaque on the wall. But what we were told as children is all the surrounding grass fields around the hospital do not dig there as a child. The reason being, we thought it was a scare story, but it's absolutely true, all the surrounding fields are full of mass graves. In this industrial town, in the first week of 1847, 18 deaths in the workhouse, followed by the following week, 36, 55, 58, 68, then 95, one week after another. They couldn't bury them fast enough due to starvation and disease. The population of Lurgan, basically we lost two thirds. I tell my students it's something like one of those Hollywood films, everybody you see here dies, and we have empty streets, including some of my own ancestors. And say, this sort of situation, you think it's part of history books, but we all know there's the potential for that type of situation to arise again. And we have to work very hard indeed to make sure this doesn't happen again. We have these murals. Um, if you've ever heard of Northern Ireland, we're famous for having murals on walls. This actually depicts um, the various stages, all the way going from the workhouse through to emigration to many parts of America. Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Now, say I show you this because, say, this is where I'm from, but we know that that's just a tiny, so we look here, we think Ireland, or indeed the United Kingdom, is massive. I always like this one, which shows you the scale of the problem we face in certain parts of the world. This shows you the United States, China, India, Europe, all fitted into the space of Africa, as you well know. The United, United Kingdom sits just here. It's a true size of the problems we face, especially when f ensuring food security. Now, the diseases we know, we've already mentioned many this morning, range from maize and lethal necrosis, cassava brown streak and mosaic, yam viruses, you name it, whatever crop there is, there'll be a range of viruses coming to attack it. So it's really important that we come up with solutions. And we know that whilst these little things may look cute on a slide, these are the major problems the vector transmitted viruses. So we know that uh, lots of human diseases have vector um, to transmit them. Just the same, we have these white flies, nematodes, aphids, transmitting these diseases. So it's really important that we understand this and come up with viable solutions that can be applied to farmers right across the continent. Some of you may know that um, my sort of history is I worked on cassava brown streak disease uh, many years ago. Uh, which is causing uh, amazing problems. And one of the interesting things is, when we first discovered what caused cassava brown streak, I seemed to get the blame for the, the emergence of this disease right across the continent. Because once we published, then everybody else started to publish. But I think numbers of publications is a good indication of the severity of a particular disease in a country. And this is just one example we could do. Um, me as lethal necrosis as well, very, very similar. And the amount of incidence is rising uh, ever upwards. Now, in terms of what we're all here for today, is the UK government a few years ago, rightly or wrongly, came up with an idea called Global Challenges Research Fund, which was one and a half billion pounds worth. It was to be spent on particular scientific solutions. And one of the calls they came up with was GCRF Networks and Vector Board Disease Research. And uh, we have Melissa from BBSRC, who'll be talking later on this afternoon. And we thought that a lot of the money would go to malaria research and other type human and animal diseases. But a group of us, who are many are in the room today, gave up the idea we would put in a bid for a plant virus vector borne disease network. And the amazing thing is that these three people were a driving force, but many of the other people who were on our management board inputted into this. But these were the three main people who were still typing on their computers with five minutes to go to the deadline. So they deserve the credit. We cut it right to the last minute. 
There were lots of emails going around going, I've lost track. What was the latest version? And things like that. Um, the other person I have to highlight is when we were making this bid, one of the reasons I got sort of pushed to the, the front to lead it was the University of Bristol also committed a very large amount of money. We have something at the university called the Cabot Institute, which looks at risk, be it earthquake, be it um, volcanoes erupting, all sorts of risk. And food security is one of the research themes. So they offered a whole pile of their staff and time to, for free to actually support this network. And Healy and our team are going to be helping, helping us over the next couple of days to actually uh, facilitate the workshops that we're going to have. She's not here today because she's running the um, Cabot uh, annual lectures, which are on at the university tonight. If you're at a loose end, you can register and go and see those. They're quite diverse, but very, very um, big speakers uh, speaking with those. Our management board um, is just fantastic. These are the people who initially supported us and helped uh, pull the grant together. Many of the management board were sending us CVs and supporting letters in the last minute as well. We have a chair in Professor Nicholas Spence. We have Lava as deputy chair. And when we went to interview for this with BBSRC, they said, how on earth did you pull together such a fantastic managerial board? We answered with basically bribery, blackmail, and promising of good wine and good food. Uh, so they'll hold me to that <laughs> over the next couple of days. In terms of how we organized it, we wanted a very good mix of academic policy and translational research. So we had that right at the start as part of the management board. In terms of expertise, we had virology and vectors, social science, and impact. Now, those are people who we initially brought together onto the management board. We have no doubt that that will grow and change as the project goes forward. And we think it's really important that it does. So what is connected? What are we proposed to do? Well, it aims to build a sustainable network of international scientists to tackle this. We have, um, in terms of this, the idea is you, there's lots of programs going on, but maybe not the conversations going between uh, different funded programs. So as to bring this sort of army of researchers and scientists, policymakers, all together to really tackle this problem under this one umbrella of connected. And we actually have some connected umbrellas in case it rains, especially branded, just in case. In terms of what we propose to do, we would have pump priming funding. It's not a huge amount of money, I'll show you in a second. But it's to be able to for you to start collaborations and interesting projects. And we're going to be developing what those areas should be over the next couple of days. All of you as network members will have input into that. We will have training workshops. We will have... Uh, African launch, we will have meetings like this, etc. We will have a fantastic website that will give you lots of information on vector-borne diseases as well. And in terms of um, the award, it's roughly about a million pounds worth of for network training activities here in Africa and elsewhere. We'll decide what those are over the next couple of days. And about a million pounds for pump priming research awards, which we're going to encourage to be collaborative where I set up the website. So when we appointed, um, well, the first thing we had to do was appoint a team to run all of this. And we're incredibly lucky, I mean, Neil and I, if you know us well, we stagger from one chaotic moment to the next. So these amazing people, who I'll do a brief introduction, are the ones you've probably been corresponding with a lot. Nina uh, worked at BBSRC, the funding council. So we've stolen her away from the research council that gave us the money. Good contact. <laughs> Diane Hurd, um, she stands up, she'll be shy, but she will. Uh, many of you will have interacted with her if you submit a paper to molecular plant pathology. She ran, she literally ran. There was an editor in chief, but he tended not to do much. The real powerhouse was Diane uh, running molecular plant pathology for the last 17 years. Sonia, who's been, uh, is she here? Or is she still on the desk? Um, we stole her from our Pro Vice Chancellor's uh, personal office. She was the PA to our Pro Vice Chancellor's. So we've got direct access now to the hierarchy of our own university. And Richard Wyatt um, is our communications officer. He takes all the pretty pictures, uh, does the website, and does lots of exciting animations and stuff. He's worked for several MPs, uh, members of parliament in Britain, 
So we've got links there to go straight through to Parliament as well. You could almost have dreamed this dream team, couldn't you? Once we had the team appointed, things like website set up, a logo, which we hope you like, social media accounts. Then we had our lunch meeting in the UK, which is what you're at today, where we're going to set some of our um, targets, our priorities, and our agenda. And then we're going to back that up with a meeting in Uganda, which you'll hear a little bit more about over the next couple of days, training visits, etc. But the most important part of this whole network is to establish, build, and support an amazing network. And that's where you guys are all involved, because this is a network. This is everybody. There's no hierarchy. Everybody is equal. And the work you put in over the next couple of days is going to really strengthen how important this network is. And we are going to work you over the next couple of days. But hopefully, it'll be relaxed. We have a beautiful view. I don't know if you, know if you realize yet, but lots of the doors are open onto the balcony. So you can take lots of amazing pictures. We're taking you to the SS Great Britain as well. So hopefully, whilst we work hard, you actually enjoy your time in Bristol as well. Thank you for listening, and welcome to Bristol. And more importantly, welcome to Connected. Thank you very much indeed.